come before you humbled at your presence. We come before you, Lord, knowing that you know us by name, that you see us today. So come and fill us with your spirit. Come and renew us in body and mind. Lord, come and test us. Look well within us and see if there's anything offensive in us, Lord. And lead us to the way that is everlasting. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you have one of these on you even now? Everybody, almost everybody? Got a phone? Yeah, so, so if, you, if you were to try to get in touch with somebody... Or if someone was to try to get in touch with you, this is probably how you would do it, right? I mean, raise your hand if you still have a home phone. See, that number went down a lot because we don't expect people to actually call our home phone number if we know them, right? And so most of the time, even if you have a home phone, you probably never answer it. You just use it as a resource for yourself or maybe your family calls that. But most of the time, we expect to get in touch with people on our cell phones. We expect to, for them to reach us on our cell phones. In fact, we would probably call and text someone or try to maybe use some other form of social media in hopes of hearing or in hopes of receiving important information that we want to know about someone else or that we want others to know about us. That's probably how we communicate more than anything else is through our phones calling, texting, or posting something on some form of social media. I mean, this happens to me a lot, and I actually get kind of frustrated by it. But how many times, how many times has someone expected you to know what has happened in their life because they posted it to Facebook? Anybody have that experience? Now, I don't ever use Facebook. I'm not, I do have a Facebook account, but I never, ever look at it. And so it's frustrating to me as a pastor when people go, well, didn't you know I've been in the hospital for three days? No. How was I supposed to know? You didn't call me. I posted it to my Facebook. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't do Facebook. So that's just a word to the wise, right? If you're sick, call me or text me. Don't post it to Facebook and expect to see me show up. It won't happen. But, uh, but hopefully, hopefully, I mean, people do that all the time, right? We expect people to know what's going on in our lives because we post something on social media. We might text a group or call a friend or something like that, and we also get to know things that way. And, and cell phones certainly are a very helpful means of connecting people together, connecting one another. Uh, so as good as, as cell phones can be in, in, in good reasons and good ways of using them, there's nothing better, right? There's nothing better, though, than spending a few minutes with someone in person, Right? I mean, as good as this thing is and all the lovely posts that you'll go and look through as you're sitting there doing nothing, all that compared to just five minutes with a person face-to-face -face doesn't compare, does it? I mean, how many of you would rather talk to your grandchildren on the phone versus seeing them face-to-face? -face? How many of you would rather be in a group text instead of just having that group together, hanging out with one another for the afternoon. As good as the phone might be, relationships are meant for something else. And if you really want to know someone, it takes listening. It takes being together to know who that person is, to know what that person is actually like. It takes a relationship that is more than a Facebook page or a post on other, some other form of social media to really know who someone is. And this morning, this morning we hear stories of God calling people, calling people into a relationship with him. Samuel was a young boy when he hears the voice of God stirring in the night. He doesn't know what he's hearing 
He doesn't know what it is. It says that he didn't know God at that time. He hadn't been apprised of what God was like at that moment. But he hears God stirring. He hears God speaking. And so he he assumes it must be his ailing mentor calling out for him, I need some help. There's a little bell ringing in the other room, right? That's what he assumes is happening. So Samuel gets up and he goes to Eli and he says, what do you need, master? I didn't say anything. Go back to bed or go back and lay down. He's laying in front of the Ark of the Covenant. He's laying nearby that. An incredible spot to be resting, right? Or to watching through the night. Just imagine that for a moment. And it happens again. And he goes back to Eli and still, again, it wasn't me. Go back. On the third time of that happening, Eli finally goes, wait a minute. Where are you sitting? Well, where am I supposed to? In front of the Ark or by the Ark. So, oh, okay. Samuel. Next time you hear that voice, if it happens again, simply say, Lord, your servant is listening. So on the fourth time, when God says, Samuel, Samuel says, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak, Lord. And what God begins to reveal to him is the beginning of a a prophetic mission, ministry, that will actually fulfill Samuel's life purpose. In many ways, the very reason why he was given to the priest from his mom. Samuel will learn how to be faithful to the call of God. The call that God has placed upon him. And this is the place, as a small child, where Samuel learns to hear the voice of God and how to distinguish it from all others. That's important. He learns to hear the voice of God and how to distinguish it from all others. And when the Lord calls out to him, this is a call to relationship. It's a call to relationship that's more valuable than any other relationship. Even in this text, Samuel is called to speak a very, very hard or tough word to his master. Samuel doesn't want to. He's disturbed by what he hears, right? He's thinking, I got to go lie. I can't tell him what I heard from the Lord on this one. It's not going to be good for him. He's not going to like it, and he's my my father figure. He's the one that I love and who's cared for me. That's what he's thinking. But in this moment, he learns that this relationship with God is more important than any other relationship he knows. And Eli actually encourages him and says to him, you better tell me what the Lord said. I know you might not want to, but you don't listen to anybody else except Yahweh. And so Samuel has a very hard word. For Eli. A very tough word for Eli. But Samuel learns obedience. He learns what it means to speak the things of God. To be the prophetic voice he's been called to be. And he's faithful in that. He learns how to distinguish the Lord's voice from every other voice. And he learns that God can be trusted. And that trusting in God is the only way to fulfill his life's purpose. And then in our gospel account. Jesus calls his disciples and he calls out to them by saying, come and see or come and follow. In the previous text, Jesus has been calling. He, he, and when he says, come and see, come and follow, it's an invitation. That itself is an invitation to be in relationship with Jesus. A disciple, a, a figure, a rabbi might go around and, and invite people to come and be with him, to be their student, to come and see, to come and hear, to come and follow them to become in relationship with them, with them, with him as their teacher. And so when Jesus says that, that's exactly what he's doing. He's inviting them into relationship. It's an invitation to be known, to know and to be known by Jesus. Andrew follows Jesus. And in the previous text, Andrew it was John's disciple. He then goes to follow Jesus. Jesus speaks to him and talks to him. And Andrew goes and gets his brother Peter. That's no slouch of a family, right? He goes to get Peter, and Peter follows. The next day, Jesus goes to Galilee, but it says that Philip was from the same city as Andrew and Peter. Now, they would have known each other, at least known of each other, no doubt. It wasn't that big of a world back then in that kind of way. And so Jesus goes and calls Philip, and he says, come and see, come and follow. Again, initiating that relationship with Philip. And when Philip goes to see, and Philip can't imagine what he is seeing and what he's experiencing, and Philip goes to find his friend, Nathaniel. 
And Philip invites Nathaniel to come and be a part of this relationship with those same words, come and see. And yet this is where the story gets interesting. Perhaps it also tells us a little bit why Philip went to go get Nathaniel. But Jesus sees them coming, and when Jesus sees Nathaniel and Philip coming to him, towards him, Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. It may not be, but for me, I see a little bit of pride in Nathaniel's response. It may not be the case. It may be he was really holy and righteous and all those kinds of things, and that was just the real, real truth about what he was doing and what, he was, what was going on. But there seems to be a little hint of spiritual pride. Because when Jesus says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, he doesn't go, Who are you talking about, Philip? No, he goes, How do you know me? <laughs> that seems a little odd to me if you're humble, right? Like, yeah, of course I'm the righteous person. I'm not deceitful. I'm holy. I'm righteous to Jesus. There's a complete unawareness of who he's talking to. In fact, we know that Nathaniel doesn't believe in Jesus at this moment because he says nothing good can come from Nazareth. He's not expecting to see anything. He's going with his friend to go see this person he's talking about, but he has no faith that this is going to be anything, going to make anything out of this until the next sentence where he says, how do you know me? And Jesus says, when Philip came to get you, I saw you under the fig tree. And in this moment, the most miraculous thing ever happens. Nathaniel goes from, how do you know me, to you are the son of the living God. You are the promised Messiah. You are the king of Israel. Now that's a huge shift. Going from what good can come from Nazareth to you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. I mean, that's a proclamation that goes from the bottom to the top in one breath. What happened under that fig tree? Do y'all ever wonder that? You ever read that story and thought, what was Nathaniel doing under the fig tree? I, I've always wondered that. And you can't find a good answer. There is no scholar that has been able to answer that question specifically. Most scholars will say he was praying and worshiping God, doing something like that, and they just kind of leave it there. And he probably was doing that, but can, I don't think the prayers that he were praying was his normal prayers of the day. I don't think it was his morning hours that he was experiencing in that moment. I mean, because if God saw me doing my morning prayer in the church on my own, I'd be like, yeah, you know I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to do. But if I'm broken and I'm at my knees on the altar, or I'm laying prostrate on the floor because I'm just empty and I'm broken before the Lord, and the Lord says, I saw you, at the altar, that's going to change me. Something else is going on altogether different. And there seems to be something like that happening. No one really knows what it is, but something was taking place. How can he go from, can anything good come from Nazareth to you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel? How can that happen? It had to be something that Nathaniel was expressing from the depths of his heart in that time of prayer, in that moment under the fig tree. Something was taking place, if it was good. Something was taking place under the fig tree. I believe it had to be something that expressed the deepest part of his soul. Maybe, maybe perhaps, maybe perhaps it was a deep longing to see the Messiah. Maybe it was a passionate prayer for the salvation of Israel. I mean, that would be an Israelite in whom there was no deceit. Maybe it was those things. But I, I tend to think it was something that he knew, only God knew about him. That's just my opinion. It's not anything I can prove or will you ever find it supported in any way. But from how I know the presence of Jesus in my own life, and how I've seen that happen in the lives of many other people. It happens when we realize God knows something about us that we were hoping no one would ever realize or know about us. Maybe it was a struggle with pride or fear. Fear of his doubt would be found out. 
Or maybe it was anxiety that threatened to undo him. Maybe it was something that he never told anyone. That he wished no one would ever know about him. But when Jesus says, here's an Israelite in whom there is no seat, deceit, he knew God knew everything about him. And in this place that he was trying to hide from everybody, God saw him. That would change you from what good can come from Nazareth to you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. In my opinion, in my speculation, that's what Jesus did when he says, here's an Israelite in whom there is no seat. In some ways, I believe Jesus was setting him up to see clearly his invitation to be in a relationship where he would be fully known and yet fully embraced. And speaking to Nathaniel that way, an invitation to be fully known and fully embraced. Much like many other places in the scripture where Jesus engages his audience, you know, there's, you probably remember several stories where you go, they were saying something or thinking something. Jesus says, and the scripture tells us, Jesus knew what they were thinking or Jesus knew what was in their heart and so he said, right? They're, they're thinking one thing, they're doing this one thing and Jesus is not even a part of the conversation, not even part of the dialogue. He's, it's, most of the time it seems like he's almost like out walking in front of them and they're sort of arguing behind him or talking behind him or or he's talking to a crowd and the Pharisees are over on the side grumbling and complaining about stuff. And he goes, the scripture tells us, and he knew what was in their heart. And so he said to them. It's like, like he knows what's going on and he speaks to those very moments, to those very issues. It's kind of like when he goes to Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Right? When he, when he goes to the adulterous woman, the woman who's caught in adultery, and he starts writing in the sand, another a place where we have no idea what he writes. But whatever he writes, the response is the oldest Pharisees start to leave first. After he has said, he who is without sin throws the first stone. I, I don't know what he wrote in the sand. No one does. But as they reflected on that moment, as they saw that jester, it penetrated their hearts personally. And they responded in some way. And it's also kind of like the woman at the well, right? Where Jesus tells the woman, go and get your husband and come back and we'll have a conversation. And she says, I don't have a husband. He goes, oh yeah, that's right. You're right. You've had five husbands. And the, and the person you're living with now, he's, he's not your husband. You're living in sin. But, but go and get him anyway. And she, she hears Jesus say that and she goes, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Right? She goes from like, who are you? you would ask, why are you asking me for a drink of water? I can see you're a prophet, right? Because Jesus sees in her heart. He, see, she, he sees the thing that she's hoping no one would really ever discuss or talk about. He sees the greater need. He sees the, the real thing going on. Oftentimes when Jesus engages with people like this, he engages with people in a way that they're the only ones that can know exactly the depths of what he's saying. Like he says stuff, and other people there are hearing it, but the people in the corner, Peter walking beside the sea, the woman at the well, they're the only ones, when they hear Jesus say it, really understand the depths of what he's talking about. Because he's speaking right into their soul. Nathaniel may have been known for his faithfulness and dedication to the Lord, but Jesus saw into the depths of his being. Jesus saw into the depths of his being and he spoke to whatever it was that no one else could have possibly known about him in that moment. And in that moment, Nathaniel's life was changed. In that moment, he knew, he knew he was in the presence of God, the presence of God's promise being revealed the Son of God, the King of Israel. It's hard to imagine what could have actually taken place in that short little dialogue that would cause that reaction, but it had to be something. What was going on under the fig tree? Whatever it was, Jesus says, come and see. Jesus says, come and follow. Invitations. These are invitations to a relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the maker and creator of all things. A relationship that is real. 
a relationship that is personal, a relationship that goes deeper than words on a screen or a post from a friend, a relationship that reveals that he knows everything about you, all your joys, all your sorrows, where he knows everything about you, all your fears and all your failures, where he knows everything about you, all your weaknesses, all your temptations, where he knows everything about you, all your brokenness, all your pain. He knows everything about you. Everything that you've tried to hide from others, hoping that no one will ever find out. He knows it all. And he calls out to you to come and see. Come and follow. To come and enter into a relationship with the promise of God's presence. A relationship that will extend the promise of God's power. A relationship that will offer you the promise of God's purposes. A relationship with you that will change you from who you were to who he is calling you to be. To go from the not really knowing so much about him to being able to distinguish his voice from all others. To go from being prideful or living in your own strength and abilities to be fully to being fully exposed, knowing that God knows you more than you know yourself, yet God still loves you. That's the invitation. And like the text in 1 Corinthians suggests, a relationship that guides you in perfect freedom. Go back and read that text again. It's not a text that tells you what not to be. It's a text that tells you what it means to live in the freedom that Jesus has given you. To see the freedom that he has given you and in whose freedom you have an opportunity to be about his kingdom purposes and not your own. Because you know that he is faithful. faithful. Because you know that he is trustworthy. So like Samuel, you'll do whatever he tells you. Or like Mary tells the servants at the wedding, do whatever he tells you. Unfortunately, many people engage their faith in relationship with God in about the same way they engage relationships with other people. From a distance. Acting like everything's going great. See my smile? How fun, not much fun we had on that vacation. Everything's going great. Never expecting God to be too close. And certainly not they too close to God. Not expecting much other than what they want, how they want it, and when they want it. Expressing an occasional rant when things don't go their way, when life gets hard. Sharing a post, sharing or only posting what they want everyone to see, but inside feeling lost, empty, isolated, afraid. Afraid that they might be found out to be who they really are. Afraid that maybe their faith is not really faith at all. Having no idea what it means to be guided by God's power. Having no idea what it means to be guided by God's presence having no idea what it means to be guided by God's purpose for their life. And even if we know our faith is real, and even if we know God has guided us along life's journey, we have to admit that there are times and there are seasons, or at least circumstances, when we find ourselves falling back to those old types of patterns. Where are we this morning? Come and see. Come and follow. Will you find your fig tree and be real with God? 
Like Psalm 63, will you press into the relationship in which Jesus invites you to come today? Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh also longs after you in a bare and dry land where there is no water. Because you have been my helper. Therefore, under the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand has upheld me. If you want to know freedom in Jesus, if you want to know freedom in Jesus, find your fig tree. Find your fig tree. Hear Jesus say, I see you even there. I know you. I call to you. Come and see. Come and follow. Jesus invites you. Jesus invites me into a relationship with him that is personal, where we are fully exposed, yet fully loved. You don't have to hide. You don't have to be ashamed. Trust in him. Learn to hear his voice and distinguish it from all others. Will you seek him? Will you listen to him? Will you allow his wisdom, the wisdom of his word and his Holy Spirit guide you to the heart of the Father in all that life brings your way? If so, you too will learn that God can be trusted and that by trusting in God is the only way to find your purpose in life being fulfilled. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Amen.